Thank you very much. You may be seated. I am truly excited to be here tonight. This is a, this is a tremendous occasion. And every WLI graduation is a tremendous occasion to me. I, um, the older I get, the more I love these events. I got about a third of the way down the aisle. I almost broke into tears. I felt like crying, but I decided not to. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm, just, I'm just so delighted that uh, Cheon has taken the reins of WLI as international chancellor and is taking WLI to levels that I never could have, could have done. So that is what, uh, that is a fulfillment, Bill, of leading from behind. Now I'm behind and it's going forward and um, the future of WI is tremendous. I mean, just over this last, these last few days, doors opened in Latin America that were never opened before. We never had a WLI, in, a successful WLI in Latin America. Now I think we're gonna have six. And uh, I believe God has provided uh, for this. Now before um, I knew that I was going to give the graduation address, I had talked to Che about what I was going to speak on in the leadership conference. So I'm going to speak on the subject that we agreed on at this graduation ceremony. And the title of this message is The Basics of Cheerful Giving. <laughs> the Basics of Cheerful Giving. Now let's see if we can get that uh, on the screen. We've got it, good, all right. Now our fundamental uh, text for this is 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7 which you're familiar with, so let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now I'm going to talk about cheerful giving, not just ordinary giving. I'm going to talk about cheerful giving. But I'm not quite ready. Now, I'm taking a risk because this is a new joke. <laughs> and, and I need you to let me know if this is a keeper, but I, 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 it's, worth, it's worth giving a try. All right? <laughs> You're going to love this. <laughs> you ready for this? Say yes. yes. All right. <laughs> a defendant in a lawsuit involving a large sum of money was talking to his lawyer. If I lose the case, I'll be ruined, he said. It's in the judge's hands now, said the lawyer. Would it help if I sent the judge a box of cigars? Oh, no, said the lawyer. This judge is a stickler for ethical behavior. A stunt like that would prejudice him against you. Him against you. He might even hold you in contempt of court. In fact, you shouldn't even smile at the judge. Within the course of time, the judge rendered a decision in favor of the defendant. As the defendant left the courthouse with his lawyer, he said, thanks for the tip about the cigars. It worked. Of course, uh, uh, I, I'm sure that we would have lost the case if you had sent them. Oh, oh no, he said, but I did send them. You did? Yes, that's how we won the case. Oh, I don't understand, said the lawyer. It's easy. I sent the cigars to the judge, but enclosed my opponent's business card. <laughs> All right, which brings us to cheerful giving. <laughs> Now, I want to ask you a theological question to, be, to begin this talk, okay? Now, we all know God loves everyone. We even sang it in our songs tonight. But let me ask you a question. Does God love some people more than others? 
Well, yes, he does. God, it says right here that God loves givers more than non-givers. He loves them more. <laughs> when, when, when does he draw the line? Well, every, you know, everyone gives, but everyone's not a giver. There's a difference between giving and being a giver. So right up front, let me give you a clear picture of where, what Christian giving is in the United States. Now, I'm going to quote a sociological study. We get a picture of that book on there, and uh, it's called Passing the Plate by Christian Smith and Michael Emerson. And um, th these are sociologists who studied giving in America. Now, I just, I'm just pulling some uh, quotes from this study of American giving. First of all, there's a summary in the introduction that says, all of the evidence we will see points to the same conclusion. When it comes to sharing their money, most contemporary American Christians are remarkably ungenerous. Then the first statement he makes in chapter one, that was the introduction. Here's the first statement he makes in chapter one. If American Christians were to give from their income generously, not lavishly, mind you, only generously, they could transform the world. Interesting that he is using that language. They could transform the world starting right away. Ordinary American Christians have within their power the capacity to foster massive and unprecedented spiritual, social, cultural, and economic change that closely reflects their values and interests. Now, this is a little bit more concretely. It comes on page 13. It says, we estimate that if committed Christians in the United States gave 10% of their after, they're even going for after-tax income. I'll come to that later. But uh, <laughs> fully, but no more than 10%, that would provide an extra. Get this, see that word extra? That would provide an extra $46 billion per year of resources with which to fund needs and priorities. Then they list six facts about American giving, and I've just uh, chosen three. This is, um, this is fact number one. At least one out of five American Christians, 20% of all U.S. Christians, gives literally nothing to the church, parachurch, or non-religious entities. Fact number four. Higher income earning American Christians, like Americans generally, give little to no more money as a percentage of household income than lower income earning Christians. Fact number five. Despite a massive growth of real per capita income over the 20th century, the average percentage share of income given by American Christians not only did not grow in proportion, but actually declined slightly during this time period from 3% uh, to 2.5% in the 20th century. Now, I just put those on here because I think we need some teaching on giving. I think we, this needs to spread throughout our churches. I'm not just teaching you. I am teaching you tonight, but I want you to teach this too. Incidentally, like all my materials, I don't teach for me. This material isn't for me. This material is for you. If you like what you're getting and you want to teach this, um, I'll get in, just get in touch with me and I'll have my assistant Janine uh, email you these, uh, this PowerPoint. And uh, this, because this teaching really needs to get out as much as we can. Now, obviously, God loves cheerful givers more than reluctant ones. I know it sounds funny, but it's, 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 it's true. Not all givers are cheerful. Some give grudgingly. It says in uh, verse 7, they got bad attitudes. And some give of necessity. That means they give of compulsion or through manipulation. And that's not what, that, that's not what God loves. So I want to help. What do I want to help you do? I want to help you be a cheerful giver. I want to, I'm going to give you seven basic rules for cheerful giving. And I hope this lesson works. This will be the proof. I'll see you outside. And I'll see if it says, that was the best sermon on giving I've ever heard. <laughs> so I'm, 
That is, a, everybody has to test their success. That's how I'll test mine. I'll be waiting for you out there in the lobby. <laughs> All right, rule number one. And I see, I'm really very glad to see many of you are taking notes. Rule number one, generous giving. Now the question is, why is giving important? And you have four things that are actually part of who you are. They are at your disposal. No one else disposes of them. You ultimately dispose of them. You have time. You have talents and abilities. You have energy. And you have money. And you should share each one of the things in this list with others. And if you don't share them with others, you're selfish. And that's a bad character flaw. Now, this lesson, I'm only going to deal with money. I'm going to deal with the last one. So I want to point out, I want you to make sure that you understand that your money is part of who you are. It's just as much a part of who you are as your shoulder or your liver. Your money is part of you. And in most cases, the money that you have comes from your work. Some goes to the government, but the rest is yours. Now, I'm stressing this very strongly. The rest is your money. And when you give your money, you are giving part of who you are. This is very important. I know that a lot of us haven't thought about this, but that is, well, that, that is the, that, that's the truth. Now, where do we give the money? Well, usually, with the money we earn, we give to our family. Our family needs it, and, um, and we take care of our family. So by giving your money, you're giving yourself to your spouse and to your children. And that's the normal uh, way of life. But how about giving outside of the family? Well, you just saw the statistics. Another one is that the average American across the board gives 2% to charity. I'm talking about all Americans. And some give none. But that's not generous giving. 2% is token giving. It's not generous giving. And so what you do is you use this scripture as a measuring stick. Look at Matthew 6, 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It doesn't say where your heart is, your treasure is. It says where your treasure is, there your heart is. If I want to know where your heart is, you know how I can test it? I can test it where your treasure is. And I know where your heart is. Now you might say you're probing. Yes, right. But I'm just reading the Bible at this point and stressing it that uh, that is a test of where your heart is, where your, uh, where your treasure is. So I'm going to try to show you how to be a generous giver. Rule number two is tithing. Now, the first, in my opinion, the first and most important step toward generous giving is the tithe. The tithe means, literal meaning of the tithe is 10% of your income. Tithing is biblical. And Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 through 10 is one of the best portions of scripture we have on tithing. It says, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? Now, there's a premise here. I, don't, I hope you caught this. The premise is that the tithe is God's money, not yours. I'll repeat it. The tithe is God's money, not yours. If you keep it, you rob God because you're keeping whose money? You're keeping God's money. And it says you're cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. In other words, ignoring what I just said brings what? It brings a curse. I'm not making this up. I'm not trying to make up something to lay on you. I'm just, I'm just quoting uh, the scripture. And then it says later, if I, it says, bring all the tithes to the storehouse that there may be food in my house and prove me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. You know, some, some people say you shouldn't test God. You shouldn't unless he asks you to. Let me read again. Prove me now in this, says the Lord. You're supposed to test God in this one. 
And it says, see, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you much blessing, there will not be room enough to receive it. Now, don't fall into the trap of deciding this is Old Testament, but we live in some kind of New Testament grace that annuls this scripture. This is very important scripture. It may not be in the New Testament, but in my Bible, it's only one page away. That's close enough. <laughs> but just think, Jesus, Jesus and the apostles practiced tithing. Now, how do we know that? Because they were good Jews. And the Old Testament was the only Bible they had. And good Jews tithe. All good Jews tithe. And they were good Jews. Their father Abraham started the whole thing. He started the whole thing by tithing to Melchizedek. Now, I'm, I know I'm bringing up passages that you're familiar with. These, these aren't new, but I'm putting them together so you can see the pattern here. And it says in Hebrews 7, uh, 1 and 2, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. So Abraham started this, and all good Jews since then uh, tithe. Now, it's very curious that I've found, and you undoubtedly know this too, that some preachers preach against the tithe. They actually preach, they, don't, they actually don't ignore the tithe, they preach against the tithe. Now, let me talk about that. One of their common arguments is that God does not own ten, only 10% of what you have. He owns 100%. You've heard that. Everybody in this room has heard that. I don't know where they get that twisted logic. That makes no sense at all. My guess is they get it from the spirit of religion. And uh, because it sounds so pious. But think about it. Doesn't God allow human beings to have their own possessions? I think so. God may be the source, but God is a true giver. If you give something, if you're a true giver, but feel that after you give it, you still retain ownership, that's not true giving. When you give, you release ownership to the person to whom uh, you give. God wants us to have personal discretion, personal discretion over 90% of our income. But the other 10% isn't even ours. We don't have discretion over it. The other 10% is God's. And is, is, when I make a statement like that, is that legalism? Yes. It's sanctified common sense legalism. <laughs> it's good biblical legalism. It's like driving on the right-hand side, the side of the road or paying your income tax or, or putting seat belts on an airplane. All that's legalism, and you do it. You're supposed to do it. It's the right thing to do. And my suspicion is that those who disagree and preach against the tithe, I'll bet that, that less than one-tenth of one percent of them do tithe. They all give less than 10 percent. So what they're really teaching is a cop-out. They're justifying their own giving patterns. George Barna's research in 2007 found out that only 9% of born-again Christians tithe their income. Isn't that surprising? 9%. And it's interesting. 24% of evangelicals tithe and 11% of Pentecostals and Charismatics tithe. Oh, here we are, hoop it up, you know. I mean, we're, 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 we're Pentecost, we, we know the Lord, we're filled with the Holy Spirit, but we don't tithe as much as evangelicals. Why not? Because we need teaching like this. We need to, we need to wake up. We need to start learning how to give. Most cheerful givers I know take this first step of tithing. Most cheerful givers to do it. And then they go on to step Number three, rule number three, which is offerings. First is tithes, next is offerings. Now, legalism stops with the tithe. When you get to, uh, to, get, to get, get to offerings, it's, no more, it's, no, it's not legalistic anymore. It's all optional. But generous givers always give more than 
they give tithes, and above the tithes, they give offerings. Now, let me, let me tell you the advantage of giving generous offerings. And this is in Luke 6, this is verse 38. Give, you know, you know it, but I want to, it's important here. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Now look, these, that promise I just read applies only when you give your money. It doesn't apply when you give God his money. It applies when you give your money. Then you can take the measure. You can, uh, you, and you can depend on that measure coming back to you, not only full, but, uh, but overflowing. And some people preach very piously that you never give in order to get. Why not? <laughs> the Bible tells you to. Give in order to get. Get that measure bigger. Get it, get it back. Packed down and overflowing. You know, offerings may not be legalistic, but I'll tell you what, they're beneficial. I mean, offerings are often termed as seed. Okay, I, get the, I want you to get this idea. Everybody say seed. 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 seed, okay. Who sows seed? Farmers sow seed, right? Farmers only sow seed for one purpose, to get, to get a harvest. Just the same amount as the seed? No, bigger than the seed. Second Corinthians 9, 6 says, but this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. And I'll tell you what, when you reap bountifully, everybody, you become a cheerful giver. <laughs> Rule number four is first fruits. Now, first, let me give you some personal background. Doris and I, from the day we were, we were married, we made a mutual agreement to tithe our uh, salaries to our local church, which we do up until uh, up until today. So we tithe our salaries to our local church and we give regular offerings to uh, several ministries. Now, what I thought for years was that giving first fruits means that when you get your money, you first, the first money you spend out of your salary, you give to the Lord. You give your tithe and offerings and that's your first fruits. Uh, wrong. Robert Henderson came along, and uh, I tell you, he has given us a tremendous, tremendous teaching on first fruits. Um, his, his, uh, his book is out. Let's get a picture of his book, The Caused Blessing. And um, Robert Henderson, an apostle, he's a great teacher in WLI, very, very popular. And um, he's part of an apostolic network that I have. Jay's a part of it as well. And um, Eagle's Vision apostolic team. And he clarified uh, first fruits. And this is the best book we have on it right now. And I now see that giving first fruits is over and above tithes and offerings. It's not included. Now, let me make three observations regarding first fruit. For some of you, this is new. And it hasn't been a long time since Doris and I have practiced this. The first mention of first fruits. There's a law of first mention in the Bible. This is the first mention of first fruits in the Bible. It comes in Exodus 23:19. The first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. That's where it starts. That's, a, that, that's an order. That's what they're supposed to do. Check your concordance. That first fruits appears 34 times in the Old Testament and seven times in the New Testament. So that's pretty good. That's, that's, that, that means it's pretty uh, biblical, biblical. One of the clearest chapters for first fruits is Numbers chapter 18. You ought to just, just check that out. And I'm going to read a couple of verses, but you've got to keep this in mind. In, in, um, in, um, in Numbers 18, God is talking to Aaron, okay? And Aaron, remember, remember that? He was the high priest. you got to, this, this chapter is God talking to Aaron. That's important later, but just keep that in mind, okay? So in this chapter, we, we learn that tithes go to the Levites, the equivalent of whom in the New Testament times is the pastors. And it says, Numbers 18, 21, Behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tithes in Israel as an inheritance in return for the work which they perform, the work of the tabernacle of the meeting. But the first fruits go to Aaron. Numbers 18, 21 says, All the best of the oil, all the best of the new wine and grain, their first fruits which they offer to the Lord, I have given them to you. Don't forget, this chapter is written to Aaron. 
I've given them to you, the, uh, the, all the first fruits. Now, the interesting thing is that first fruits show, basically show your appreciation to God for increase. You're thanking God for increase. It's not legalistic. It's an offering of thanks. Now, in an agricultural society like the Bible was written in, it's, um, it's, it's pretty easy to calculate. It was a portion of each new harvest because people lived that. Their, their life cycle was cycle of, um, of harvest. But in an industrial society, which most of us live in, uh, we have to figure out how to do this. And I'm not going to be legalistic. I'm not going to tell you how to do it. Uh, I'm just going to challenge you to give first fruits and figure out your own way of giving first fruits. So at the end of the day or the end of the month or the end of the year, you've given uh, first fruits. It couldn't be a portion of increase. If you get a raise, maybe you should give the amount of raise, of your first raise. Uh, if it's a new contract or you can make, make profit on your investment or get an inheritance, you should probably thank God and for that increase and give him uh, first fruits. It can be sim uh, systematized in the church that I go to, which is uh, Global Spheres in, in uh, Corinth, Texas. Chuck Pierce is the apostle over that church. Um, we believe in first fruit so much that we have a, a monthly celebration called Rosh Kodesh. It's the beginning of each new month. We go by the Hebrew calendar, the beginning of each new month, month. And we have a first fruits celebration. The church gets together for the purpose of first fruits. And I can tell you, this is exciting. We have a whole room full of cheerful givers. Nobody even comes if they're not a cheerful giver. They don't have to come, but we, but, but we have first fruits every, every month. It's a good way to, a good, another good way to do it. Now, this is, this is uh, HM is an apostolic network. So let me point out something about first fruits and apostolic alignment. For us, I believe that our first fruit should go to our apostle. Who's our apostle? Sitting up here. Cheon. That's where our first fruits should go. Now, why do I say that? Because the Old Testament went to Aaron, the high priest. And the, the, a, a, a argument, a, 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 there can be a good argument that the New Testament equivalent of high priest is the apostle from Hebrews 3.1. It says, therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. Now listen, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ was a high priest and apostle. Jesus Christ, high priest and apostle. High priest is the Old Testament language. Apostle is the New Testament language. And the first fruits go to the apostles. Now there's a promise for first fruits. And that's in Proverbs 3, 9, and 10. It says, honor the Lord with your possessions, with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. In other words, that's another admonition to give in order to get. This is clear. How can you ever preach against that? Rule number five, alms. Now, alms means giving to the poor and needy. And uh, this is a, 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 it's a New Testament word, but it's also an Old Testament concept. So it's a, it's a godly principle. Proverbs 19, 17 says, He who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord, and he will pay back what he has given. It's interesting. He who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord. Okay, that's giving to the poor, right? See that word lends? Lends. It means he will get back what he has given. When you give alms to everybody, don't expect it to come back packed down and overflowing. The Bible doesn't teach that. When you give alms, you get back what you give. And that's what you can expect back, but you don't get any more than that. Now, there have got a lot of examples of, of what God thinks about alms in the, in, in the Bible. Cornelius, you know the story of Cornelius. He was a good man. Why was Cornelius considered a good man by God and God sent Peter to Cornelius' house? It's because, he says, Acts 10, there was a certain man in Caesarea called, called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment, a devout man, one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the person and prayed to God uh, uh, always. 
he gave alms. He was generous with alms. God liked that. He sent Peter uh, to his house. And here's what the angel said to Cornelius. So he said to him, your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. God really likes this. He likes people to give alms. Paul, when he had his defense before uh, Felix, the governor, in Acts 24, he says, now after many years, I came to bring alms and offerings from my nation. That was one of the ways he defends himself. Notice that alms and offerings are different, aren't they? I've got alms as offering is one of my rules. Alms is another one of the rules. They're two different things. Now, there is an alms warning, okay? And the alms warning uh, is to keep the amount of your alms giving a secret. Not, not keep it a secret that you give alms. My wife and I give alms. We're not good at it. Very, we're not very good at it, but we're, I'm just... I, when you prepare a lesson like this, you've got to get yourself obeying it as well. And I found out a lot of stuff that we weren't living up to very well. And uh, uh, so it's not, how, it's not whether you give arms, but how much you give. And the scripture is Matthew uh, 6, and, and verses 1 through 4. And um, here's what it says. I, I'm, I'm putting the New King James translation here. Take heed that you do not do your alms before men to be seen by them. Remember that scripture? Otherwise you have no reward from your Father in heaven. But when you do your alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your alms may be in secret and your Father who sees in secret will reward, will himself reward you openly. So there are two observations I have. Number one, what you get back is the same amount you give. Not anymore. And Secondly, this warning I just read does not apply to tithes or offerings or first fruits. It just applies to alms. And so you will see this in the next point. Now, my next uh, point, which is rule number six, is the graduated tithe. Now, this is the most advanced form of giving. And uh, there, are, there are two principles that I want to bring forth here. Just, uh, this, basically, I'm going to do a lot of disclaimer in this one because I don't want, I don't want anybody to come, to come away uh, with the wrong idea. There are two principles. Number one, there is a spiritual gift of giving. And uh, God gives, just like any spiritual gift, God chooses who he's going to give it to. He gives some a spiritual gift of giving. That doesn't mean everybody shouldn't give. I'm, I got... I, I, I've already talked about that. But God gives a special gift of giving over and above all the rest to certain people. Romans 12, it says, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. We all have different ones. Let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith or ministry. Let us use in our ministering, who he teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy, and so forth. The whole list of gifts. And I read the whole list so you understand that Giving is in the list with the rest of all these things that we know very well are gifts. So some people have the gift of giving. And in my opinion, now I'm still trying to develop this, so I, you know, I, I cut me some slack. I think that the graduated tithe is for those who have the gift of giving. It's not for those who don't have the gift of giving. Giving. And that's what, what, the reason what I want to avoid is a guilt trip for those of, the, of you who do not practice the uh, graduated tithe. And see, there's a, the, there are different modalities of giving. I've got a spectrum here that I've drawn on the, uh, on the overhead. It goes from intentional giving, uh, which look, call, let's call that zero on the spectrum, and, uh, and spontaneous giving, let's call that 10, okay? So, um, and then if, if you do both spontaneous and uh, uh, intentional, you're a five. Okay. I, I did a blog uh, on, the, on this, and I found out that most of the people I blog uh, were intentional givers uh, with, some, with some spontaneous and some mixed the two, but it, they were mostly toward the side of intentional. Doris and I are very intentional givers. We're down like toward a one, almost all intentional 
our, our division of labor is that I do the giving. That's, we have division of labor in our marriage, and I'm the one that gives. And uh, I keep a separate checking account. It's called Sembrador, that's Spanish for sore. And, and every time I get, a, I get a paycheck or I get an honorarium or whatever I do, my, I have an automatic thing on my, in my bank, and I put my giving into my Sembrador account. It's there for good. And I don't even I don't even have to worry about it in my other account because everything I give is in my Sembrador uh, account, and I don't carry that checkbook because I might get too emotional and give spontaneously. <laughs> I don't have that checkbook with me. I leave that checkbook home. Now the other day, I last night I got emotional, and so what I did is I took out my business card and I and I wrote out that I'm going to be one of the ones that gives $1,000 to the building and put that in there. And so I made myself a note. When I get home, I'll take out my checkbook and write out my check for $1,000. So, Mark, you had me uh, be a little bit more spontaneous than I usually am. <laughs> and uh, uh, prophetic types are much more spontaneous than, than us apostolic types. I mean... My friend Chuck Pierce, I don't think he ever gave intentional in his life. What God shows me is all he gives. He carries his checkbook and uses it about three or four times during every meeting. And uh, it's, it's, it's amazing. Now, let me get, let me get uh, a little bit more personal. As I mentioned, when Doris and I got married, we promised that we would tithe. Then we went to the mission field. We, well, first, we were students, and you know how income of students is. We did graduate with no debt. And uh, then we got to the mission field for 16 years, and we lived on subsistence income. I mean, basically, we had to beg for our money, but still, all the money we got, we tithed. Then we returned to the United States after 16 years there, and for the first time, I had to fill out 1040 forms. And I did fill out my 1040 form. I remember the first one I filled out in 1971. Man, I gave 10.4% to the Lord. I felt so satisfied, 104 And then I got up to 108 one year. And, you know, I was riding along high on my great generosity with 104 10.8% until I went to, I said, now, Doris and I belong to that church you see on the freeway or that 210 freeway, Lake Avenue Church. And Ray Ortland was the pastor at this time. And I'll never forget, this is one of the things, you, there's some things you don't forget. I'll, I'll never forget this one. We were sitting in the balcony. I can tell you, almost exact seat we were sitting in. And Ray Ortland, and it was November, and in traditional churches, you have a sermon every November to raise the money for the next year, okay, on money. That's traditional. So Ray was giving his sermon on giving. And he said to the crowd, he said, I'm going to do something that I've never done before. He said, I'm going to tell you how much Ann and I give. He said, Ann and I give 25% right off the top. And I sat there in my chair, and I wish I had never gone to church <laughs> that morning. <laughs> because I, was, I had 10.8, and he was talking about 25%. So we went home. Doris and I went home. And the Holy Spirit spoke to us, and we didn't feel very good about this. So we said, okay, what we're going to start is the graduated tithe. Now, you, understand the, you can understand the principle of graduated tithe? Every year our income would go up, we would raise the percentage points. Not just the amount, that's automatic. Raise the percentage points every year that our income uh, went up. And we, usually in, we would raise it 1%, sometimes 2 or 3%. Uh, according to our uh, our increase, then the, the the theory behind that is if your income decreases, you decrease the percentage. It doesn't work. <laughs> it didn't work with us. I mean, our income decreased a couple of years, but uh, we couldn't decrease the percentage, and we reached forty percent. And uh, we figured that you know you're going to have more to applaud on later on. And uh, God, we, we felt like God said it was okay, uh, 40%. Then 
So bang, 40% of everything we get goes into that Sembrador checking account. And even personal gifts. I mean, if you want to give me $100, you got to give me 167. <laughs> I, I did my math. <laughs> because 40% goes and then I'll, I'll have $100 left over. <laughs> now we kept that a secret. We kept that a secret till last year. It was a secret other than when Emmanuel Canis Tracy, that rascal, prophesied over us and told everybody we gave 40%. I, I don't think anybody was listening to him, but uh, <laughs> he, 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 he knew he was a prophet. And... Um, uh, but but in my in a meeting of the Eva, of the uh, Eagles Vision Apostolic Team, which is my apostolic network, like I say, uh, Chase is a member of that, and Chuck Pierce is a member, of Cindy Jacobs and and uh, Bill Hammond and uh, Becca Greenwood, she's here, she's a member of that, and I don't, I'm probably I, I may be leaving out others who are here, but um, we had we talked about this in our meeting last year in 2011, and we decided that we would that we would give each other permission to go public with how much we give because we believe that we really need to use what influence we have to help generous giving and, um, and um, cheerful giving. So here are the facts. Ed and Ruth Silvoso, members of EVAT, give every year at least 51%. And um, however, in 2010, they gave 78% of their income. Che and Suan, in 2010, gave 50%. Last year, in 2011, you don't have that up here, but they gave 51%. And it's interesting, as they're an interesting couple because Sue told Che that her goal is to give 90%. <laughs> You don't see Che clapping. <laughs> but then in 2011, I took notes on this because Che, I've heard Che tell this publicly. I'm not speaking behind his back. He was in another country and a businessman who he hardly knew came up to him and gave him 200 thousand shares of stock in his company worth at that time 360,000 US dollars. He gave it to him outright. And that stock is projected to double or triple in the future. I mean, you give in order to get. And God blesses. And um, so the ons give. Bill and Evelyn Hammond give 50%. And Ralph and Tommy Femright, uh, they gave 46% in 2010. I told you Wagner's, we gave 40. And then there's another one, another member who gave 30 but didn't want the name uh, revealed. So I'm, that, that's just some figures about people whose name, most of those names you know. And uh, they, on a regular basis, give that money, which I call, fits in my category of graduated uh, tithe. Now, I repeat, the graduated tithe is not for you to get a guilt trip. You might not give like the list that I've, uh, I've had up on the, uh, on the screen because not many do. But I promise you, I can promise you one thing, everybody whose name was on the screen is a cheerful giver. There's no reluctance there. Everyone on the screen is a cheerful giver. And um, rule number seven. Accumulate the means for giving. Now, I'm going to, I, I use John Wesley very, often, very frequently. I think I'll probably use him again, talk I'm going to give tomorrow morning. But uh, the, you, the, if you don't know it, remember John Wesley's advice. His famous advice is make all you can, save all you can, give all you can. It's not biblical, but it's like a biblical proverb. I mean, a lot of us kind of repeat that. And uh, make all you can means get a good job, get promotions. Make good profits. Kick out the spirit of poverty. I'm going to talk about the spirit of poverty tomorrow morning. We've got to really kick out that spirit of poverty. And, uh, you know, set as, a, set as a goal. I want everyone in this room from this, tonight on to set as a personal goal five different sources of income. Now, most of you are saying, well, I only have one. That's right. But at least you got 20%. That's a pretty good start. 
And you'll never have five additional sources of income unless you set a goal for five additional sources of income. And uh, Doris and I have five sources. I have five sources of income, six counting her income. <laughs> you probably wonder what they are. Uh, I get a salary. I get honoraria for speaking at events like this. I get royalties on my books. I have some investments that make a little money, and I get Social Security. <laughs> Plus Doris's money. <laughs> because I handle the family finances. So uh, anyhow, set as a goal of five uh, different sources of income. And the other admonition I have for you is get rich. Come on, get rich. Why? The richer you are, the more you can cheerfully give. That's make all you can. Save all you can. Retain a professional financial planner. I'm glad, Che, we brought that financial planner up here. What was his name, Reverend? The, the, the one that was up here on the platform. Oh, yeah, that's Augie, Reverend. Augie. I mean, in a conference like this, featuring a financial plan is very important. And don't neglect that. Find, your, find a financial importer. Uh, get a family attorney. Those are two essential things. Get a family, get a financial planner, a professional, and a family um, um, attorney. Plan your, uh, and then save all you can, uh, uh, and give all you can. Second um, Corinthians 9, 8 says, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, always having all sufficiency in all things, have an abundance for every good work. I tell you, I lived too many years with just asking God for sufficiency. With that old statement, you know, God only th deals with your, your needs, not your wants. Thank you for blasting that out of our thinking last night, Brother Bill. Dr. Dr. Bill, we're going to recognize that in a little while. But I tell you what, forget about that. God, I mean, the father, I've got kids. I want to give them what they want, not just what they need. And that's the same with our father. That's the same with our father. And um, I tell you, that we, God wants us to have abundance, not sufficiency. Why? It says, look what it says here. I will repeat it. To have abundance for every good work. How can you support good works? If you don't have abundance, if you just have sufficiency, that's the most selfish thing you can possibly ask for because you're just asking for yourself. You have to have abundance to give uh, to others. And if that's the case, you'll give cheerfully. Second Corinthians 9, 11, while you are enriched in everything. <laughs> what, what are you just saying? <laughs> oh, oh, that came up. <laughs> All right. Che cheerful while you are Enriched in everything, in all liberality, look, which causes thanksgiving through us to God. In other words, if you're enriched and with liberality, you end up with thanksgiving, which is another word for cheerfulness. So you can be a cheerful giver. I blame this on the age, but I've always been this way. Forget <laughs> Maybe, to, maybe tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter, for that wonderful message.